When the kings were afraid their soldiers might die of thirst, they sought the mysterious miracle worker, hoping for help. Instead of a promise of rain, Elisha told them to make the valley full of ditches and wait. Grab your shovels and get ready to grow with ridiculous faith. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good. Thanks for that clap. Appreciate it. If you, if you will take your Bibles out, Second, or Second Kings chapter 3. I'm a little disappointed this morning. I just have to be really honest. Um, I thought there would be a little bigger crowd to speak to. Um, wow. There's a lot of people here. Yes. We praise the Lord for that. But we, but we also call this a good problem. <laughs> And the problem part of it is we are running out of room. And I don't think everyone understands this. Our church leaders, we know this. This is not our growing period, okay? Our growing period comes later this fall. So we praise the Lord for the growth. But we plead with you this morning. If any of you would be willing to go to our 8 o'clock service. <laughs> not today. <laughs> But next week and the week after that, and until we get in the building, how's that? That's not that long. We'll, we'll make it there. Listen, if you will commit to do that for us just this next year, that would be amazing. And what it will do is it will open up seats and rooms for people who don't know Jesus. Let me ask you a question this morning. How many want to reach our community for Jesus? Okay, we're going to take all these names real quick. <laughs> Thank you for your commitment this morning. Seriously, though, man, if you could really help us out starting next week, if we could give us a, a good solid year just to come to that eight o'clock service, especially you early birds that like to get up, you may have to do breakfast, you know, after the eight o'clock service, it'll still be hot and ready for you. Listen, help us out. Okay. We want to make room for people to come to know Jesus at Orchard Church. And everybody said, Amen. Let's start, turn our Bible, 2 Corinthians, or 2 Kings chapter 3, 2 Kings chapter 3. We're continuing our series called Elisha, a tale of ridiculous faith. And this morning we're going to be talking about uh, digging ditches. Now next week, Doug will be back up here to continue our series. And I also heard a rumor. And the rumor, I don't know if it's true or not, but there may be a small group song happening next Sunday. So just let you know about that. But today we're in our second week of a four-week message series looking at the Old Testament prophet named Elisha. Elisha. Last week we talked about having a plow burning type of faith where we don't have to fully understand to obey immediately what God's calling us to do. And we also learned that those who God uses the most are the ones that hold on to the least. And our goals in the series is simply this that we build our faith, to have a ridiculous kind of faith, not only individually, but corporately as Orchard Church. A ridiculous faith. We're going to talk about that this morning. Now, before we begin, I want to uh, just ask you guys, have you, uh, if anybody in here has played the if only game, man, if only I had this, things would be better. If only I had this job, things would get better. Maybe if you're a single guy, if only I had a wife, things would be so much better. Ladies, single ladies, if only I had a husband. Maybe the married ladies, if only I had a husband with a job. <laughs> or if only I had a husband with a job that looked like Channing Tatum. <laughs> if only, if only. And throughout life, we tend to think these, these thoughts, you know, if only I had this or that, things would be better. And we think of things in the context of like our greatest need. Man, I need this. If only I had this. And th this morning, what I want you to do is look at this message through the lens of your greatest need. Now, you see, does everybody see that? Your greatest need. Just keep it in front of you and look at this message this morning. Now, now first, I want to set the context uh, of the scripture and our story this morning. And then secondly, we'll talk about the main thoughts. So let's look at the context. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 3. And uh, what we need to understand as we go into this scripture is this is three kings that are going against the big bad Moabites. And so they go, okay, if we combine forces, us three, we can take the Moabites down. No problem. Three against one. This should be an easy, decisive 
win. But what we're going to learn is things don't go as planned, which is kind of like life, isn't it? Sometimes we think, okay, if I just do this, if only we had this, oh, things would be so much better. But things don't always go as planned. And what happens is these three kings that think they've got this decisive victory find themselves in the desert with no water for seven days. No water. And what happens is they have all these troops, but they start falling off left and right because they're dying of thirst. They're animals start dying of thirst. And what happens is they find themselves with a very significant need facing them this morning. So what our story is going to teach us is a big principle. And this is in your notes. Your greatest need becomes a blessing when it drives you to depend on God. Your greatest need becomes a blessing when it drives you to depend on God. And those of you who understand this principle, maybe have lived this principle, you're probably already saying amen inside right now. But let's look at verse 9, 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 9 through 12. And we're going to set up our story here this morning. Verse 9 says this. So the king of Israel went with the king of Judah. There's two kings. And the king of Edom, there's three. And they marched on that roundabout route seven days, and there was no water for the army nor for the animals that followed them. So here we are, the three kings. They, got a, they think they have a decisive win, and then here we are. No problem, or I'm, I'm sorry, no water, and they're like, okay, we have a problem. Verse 10, and the king of Israel said, alas, for the Lord has called these three, three, three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. So like, oh man, we are in trouble. We thought we had it, and here we are getting ready to... To lose this battle. Verse 11 says this. But Jehoshaphat said. Is there no prophet for the Lord here? That we may inquire of the Lord by him? So one of the servants of the king of Israel answered and said. Elisha. Elisha the son of Shaphat is here. Who poured water on the hands of Elijah. And as we learned last week. Elijah was Elisha's mentor. And they, they probably knew this. They're like, yeah, this is, the, this is the guy who was mentored by Elijah. And they probably heard stories about Elijah when, when the nation was in a great drought. Um, Elijah called on God and God sent rain from a cloud. The cloud was the size of their hand. And it brought one of the biggest storms from the smallest cloud. So they're thinking, man, if Elijah did that and he mentored Elisha, man, I think Elisha can help us out. Now let's look at verse 12. And Jehoshaphat said, The word of the Lord is with him. Oh, who is that? Elisha. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to him. So let's review. we got three kings in the desert. They're dying of thirst. They thought they had the battle won. But it, it's not turning out like they planned, which is life. At times. Now, the other thing to remember and to understand is that these three kings are not seeking God. These are not godly kings. These are not guys that are really seeking God with all their heart and all their mind and all their strength until trouble comes. That sound familiar? You know, we get, we get ourselves in these situations and we, we're not following God, not trusting in Him, not, not in His Word, not in prayer, not growing in our faith, and trouble comes and we're like, oh yeah. God could help us in this situation. And that's what happened to these three kings. And, and, and what do they do to get help from God? They look for someone who's close to God. I mean, this happens to us as pastors, too. People are like, hey, um, you're in good with the big guy, right? Could you, like, um, say a prayer for us? We need a little help over here. And pull some spiritual strings. And they go to Elisha with that kind of manner. And I'm sure they, they've heard about Elisha's acts as well. You know, he split the Jordan River, amazing miracle. Uh, he cured uh, a poisoned spring, a polluted spring that if you drank it, uh, you would die. They probably heard the story of Elisha. And, and as we learned last week, he was a bald guy. And uh, he was walking uh, out one day and these kids come up and started make, making fun of him. And they said, hey, baldy, baldy. And so Elisha calls two bears out of the woods and the bears destroy the kids. I'm not, I can't make that kind of stuff up. I mean, I'm, I'm not that der deranged. You know, it's a, this, is, this is in the Bible. Amazing stuff. You ever read the Bible? You need to read the Bible. And they, so they probably heard about all these amazing acts from Elisha. So the three kings, they come to Elisha and they're like, help us. Prophesy for us. Give us a word from the Lord. We need an answer. And you know what Elisha does? He gives him a little bit of attitude. Okay, so let's look at verse 13. Then Elisha said to the king of Israel, 
what have I to do with you? Go to the prophets of your father and the prophets of your mother. I mean, he's got some attitude. He's bringing their mother into the situation at this point. <laughs> Little yo mama action going on. But the king of Israel said to him, No, for the Lord has called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. And Elisha said, Well, as the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand, I mean, I know you don't serve him, and I know you don't follow him, but before whom I stand, surely, were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, I would not look at you nor see you. So basically what Elisha is saying at this moment is like, okay, I normally wouldn't help you three guys out, but I've heard and seen good things from Jehoshaphat, and I respect him, so I'll help you, help you guys out today, all right? We'll, we'll, we'll pray for the Lord, and we'll pray for a prophecy here. But Elisha does have a demand, and I love his demand. Let's look at verse 15. But now, Elisha says, bring me a what? Oh, yeah. Let me just... Let me just relish this moment for a second. Bring me a musician. Bring me some mood music. I need to get in that zone. I need to talk to the Lord. I need a word from the Lord. And he says, then it happened. What? When the musician played, that the hand of the Lord came upon him. You know, there's something about music. On a real serious note, there's something about music that God has always used. And you look in scripture, God has always used music and it's, he still uses music in our life. You think about uh, most of the greatest movies ever made, the music was a huge component of that. You think about our life and our walk with God. I mean, for me, worship music is such a huge component of that. It gets me in such a, a great place this morning, standing out here worshiping with you all. Listen to that music. Man, I am ready to bring you the word of the Lord this morning because I have been in the presence of the Lord Almighty. And there's something about music that really helps us in those situations. So the three kings here are really excited. They're like, okay, we got our guy. We got him as mu musician. Now we're ready for the, wor for the word of the Lord. We're ready for some water now. God's going to help us out. But I think they weren't expecting what was to come. Verse 16. And Elisha said, he said, thus says the Lord. What does the Lord say? Make this valley full of ditches. Okay. I'm trying to put myself in one of these king's shoes. Okay, my men are dying. My animals are dropping left and right. We need water. And God is saying, I'm going to need you to do some manual labor for me. In the hot desert, son, I need you to dig some ditches. There's no sign of rain. We need water. We're dying. And God, you're asking me to dig ditches? Are you kidding me right now? This is ridiculous. <laughs> Truly ridiculous. And what we're going to see that is, is what we've already said. Your greatest need becomes a blessing when it drives you to depend on God. And everybody said... Amen. Let's look at verses 17. We'll see the promise here. Verse 17 says, For thus says the Lord, You shall not see wind, nor shall you see rain. Yet that valley shall be filled with water, so that you, your cattle, and your animals may drink. That's a really a confident statement right there from Elijah. And verse 18 says this, And this is a simple matter in the sight of the Lord. Man, that's ridiculous faith right there. That's big faith on, on, on Elisha's part. He's like, my God is big. He is mighty. This is a simple matter. He, my God's a mighty warrior, like we sang about this morning. He can handle this. This is easy. This is simple. Verse, verse 18, he says, and he will also deliver the Moabites into your hand. Also, you shall attack every fortified city and every choice city and shall cut down every good tree and stop up every spring of water and ruin every good piece of land with, stone, with stones. Now that right there is ridiculous faith on Elisha's part. He's saying, my God is big. You, need, you, want to bring, you want God to bring the rain? What he's saying is you need to do something first. You need to dig some ditches. And trust me, guys, listen, you three kings, God can do it. He's bigger. He's way bigger than your problem. And that's really the context of our story this morning. So the rest of the time, 
I want to look at this story and see how it pl- applies to our life. Let's get, just get real practical this morning. How does this concept of digging ditches apply to my life today? How is this story going to help us grow in our faith? Well, I'll tell you what it shows us, and this will be on the screen and in your notes. It shows us faith that works. Faith that works. What is a faith that works? It's a faith that actually does something. It actually shows something. You can see it. It's tangible. It's something that says, I have this much faith. I believe God is so big that I cannot help but do something because I know he's going to come through for me. And that's what God is wanting from us, a faith that works. And we're going to see two principles this morning of a faith that works. And the first one is this in your notes. Only God can send the water. Only God can send the water, but sometimes he wants you to dig a ditch. Only God can send the water, but sometimes he wants you to dig a ditch. Sometimes God is like, I need a faith that works, a faith that's active, that's doing something. We did a, we did a study uh, in last fall in the book of James, and we called it faith that works. A faith that shows itself, not just being hearers of the word, but also doers of as well. In James chapter 2, verse 26, this will be on the screen. It says, just as the body is dead without breath, so also faith is dead without good what, church? Works. See, only God can send the water, but sometimes he wants you to dig a ditch. So let me ask you something this morning. Do you think that God needed these guys to dig a ditch? Do you th- he, he's going to send the water. Do you think he needed these guys? Hey, listen, I, I want to send you water, but I really need you to do this for, for me to make this happen. Is this our God? No way. Our God can make anything happen. He's mighty. He's powerful. He's the creator of the universe. He could have been like ditches everywhere, ditches. He could be like lake, ocean. He can do whatever he wants. So what is God doing here? Why is he telling him to dig a ditch? I'll tell you what I think it is. I think what God is saying here is, listen, guys, you show me your faith, and I'll show you my faithfulness. Show me, let, I, let me say that again. I, didn't, I, I, I don't think you guys really grasp that. That's a huge statement. Show me your faith, and I, God, will show you my faithfulness. Amen. Man. And you know what? God loves to see our faith. He loves to see our faith in action, doing something. You look all over the New Testament. You see Jesus performing miracles, healing people, helping people. And you know what he did? Over and over, he saw their faith. And they were healed. He saw their faith. Now, what does that look like? What does it look like to show your faith? I mean, is it it because you're in such a deep prayer and faith in God that smoke just starts coming out of your head? (laughs) And you're like, wow, look at that person with that much faith or smoke. No, 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 no. Let me tell you something. If you see smoke coming out of my head, it's not because I'm in a prayerful mood or <laughs> probably stressed out. But it's, it's not that kind of stuff. You know what it is? It's a, it's a faith that works. It's a faith that's active. It's a faith that's doing something. It's in action. And God is looking for that kind of faith. Now, Hebrews 11.6 is a verse we all should commit to memory. We all should remember. And it says this. It is impossible to please God without what, church? Faith. It's impossible to please God without faith. It's impossible to please God without showing him our faith. And how do we do that? By serving, by discipling, by helping people, by sharing our faith. We show our faith. Maybe it's by being generous for some of us. We all have different struggles and fears. Some of us are just afraid to give in to God. Some of us are afraid just to give. And there's no greater act of bold faith than just to be generous, especially with our finances. You know, when we we teach on tithing once a year, that's a bold move for us because we want you guys to grasp it because we know it leads to a ridiculous kind of faith. Malachi 3.10, God says, like, hey, if you want to have a ridiculous kind of faith, you're going to bring your tithes to the storehouse and watch how I pour out blessings on you. And when we believe that kind of truth, we're, we're in a ridiculous faith kind of mode, everybody. But that's a faith that works. This is a beautiful statement. Doug actually told me this this week, and I was like, i got to share this. Here's what we got to do. We, you do what you can do. You do what you can do, 
and God will do what you can't do. You do what you can do, and God will do what you can't do. God is saying, look, show me your faith, and I will show you my faithfulness. The story of Peter in the New, in the New Testament and the disciples on a boat, Jesus appears to them in the water. Peter says, is that you, Jesus? You tell me to get out of this boat and walk to you, and I'll believe it's you. And Jesus says, well, come on out. Come on out. And Peter has this ridiculous faith and steps outside of the boat. The other 11 guys, they're in the boat. <laughs> they're not showing a lot of faith. We're not seeing their faith. We're seeing Peter's faith because what? Because he did something. It's a faith that works. God says, show me your faith. Show me your faith and I'll show you my faithfulness. There's times when God wants us to participate in his miracles. Did you know that? To participate, to be involved. It's still his miracles, but he's like, hey, get involved with this. Show me your faith. I'll show you my faithfulness. There was a guy uh, that was blind from birth that Jesus uh, went, went to heal. And Jesus picked up some dirt, he spit in his hand, made it mud, and then put it on the guy's eyes. Kind of gross, right? And he said, listen, I want, you, I want you to be healed of your blindness, but you got to do something for me. You need to go to the pool of Shalom and you need to wash your eyes. Do something. Show me your faith. There was a guy who couldn't walk for years and years. And Jesus wanted to heal him of that. And he didn't go all Benny Hinn on him and go, zap, you're healed. <laughs> no. What did he do? He said, show me your faith. Get up. Pick up your mats and walk. Show me your faith. And I'll show you my faithfulness. Only God can send the water. But sometimes he asks us to dig some ditches. There's times when God wants us to be a part and participate in his miracles. This hit our family in February of this year. Because we, uh, I'll never forget, uh, my wife and my daughter were out to lunch. My daughter comes down with a fever at lunch. And... Uh, She's not feeling really good. She starts getting real tired and lethargic. And if you know Jade, that's really odd <laughs> for her. And we were, we were definitely concerned. So, you know, as parents, it's tough. It's a tough call, isn't it? When your kids are sick, it's like, how sick are they? Do we nurse this at home? Do we take them to the doctor? Do we take them to the hospital? So long story short, we get her home and um, it just got worse and worse and worse, and then all of a sudden her neck got stiff about, about sometime on Saturday. And she couldn't even sit up in the bed without being in a lot of pain. Then a bump starts forming on her neck. We're like, oh man, so we're like, we gotta take her, we gotta take her somewhere. So we took her to Children's Hospital, fantastic place by the way. And um, we took her to the emergency room. They, uh, they, diagnosed her pretty quickly with a, a bacterial infection in her neck. And so they, they needed to admit her uh, into the hospital. So we did that whole process. They hooked her up to the IVs. That was a blast to do that, by the way. And, and uh, starts pumping the medicine, right? And uh, all we could do is just wait and pray and ask, the, ask God to, that, that medicine will do its job, you know, and get rid of this infection. Well, day after day goes by, and it's just not getting any better. And uh, I get to know the ENT doctors. You get an education when you're in the hospital. The ear, nose, and throat people. And they come in the room. And every morning, about 6.30 in the morning, they come in. I wake up, just waiting to see what they're going to say. They ask Jade to sit up, and it's just horrible. You know, she can't sit up. She finally get her up. It's just a lot of pain. Okay, Jade, move, move your neck to the right. Let's see if we've got any any improvement, she goes like this, and she's hurting, and go to the left, and she just can't, can't look, look down, she can kind of do that, look up, and it was just like, oh, you know, she was almost crying, there's a lot of pain, and day after day, this is going on, and man, parents, we hate to see our kids hurt, don't we? You just could, if you could just trade places, you know, we all feel that way, and about the fourth morning, they come in, the ENT comes in, and they say, listen, um, there's no improvement today. If, if, there's, if there's no improvement tomorrow morning, we're going to have to do surgery. And, you know, nobody wants to see their kids go through surgery. Nobody wants to see that happen. And so I've, you know, 
I sat there in that chair all day, uh, that fourth day, and um, just going, God, do something. We're, we're dying out here. We're thirsty. Send your rain, God. Send your water. Do something, God. And he said, Gary, you need to dig some ditches for me. You need to get up out of your chair, and you need to go pray for your daughter. So my wife and I, we, we get up, we go put our hands on our daughter, and we pray for her. And we, we say, God, you know, you're the only one that can do this. And we live for you, Lord. We believe in you. We have faith in you. We moved to Denver, Colorado just for you. We believe in you. God, heal my daughter, please. And then God spoke to me again. And he said, Gary, you need to call more people to pray. And so I hit the text and I hit the social media, the Instagram, the Twitter, the Facebook, hundreds of people all over the country praying for my daughter. I'm up every hour of the night, once, a time, once an hour, praying, God, heal my daughter. 6.30 comes around the fifth day. The stinking ENT doctors come in. I'm just kidding. They're wonderful people. Um, they come in and they, and they do their thing. They come in. They go, wake Jade up. They say, Jade, um, go ahead and sit up for us. And she pops up. And they go, oh, okay. Jade, move your head to the right. Move your head to the left. Look down. Look up. And they're like, whoa. And I am shouting inside. I'm wanting to jump through the roof. And they're like, no surgery, Jane. No surgery. And I'm sitting there going, this is a miracle of the Lord that we witnessed. No doubt in my mind or my heart do I, do I doubt for a second that it wasn't my Lord who healed my daughter. No doubt in my mind, because we serve a God who is not dead, who is alive, and is still healing. And you know what God did? He said, you need to go dig a ditch, and your friends need to dig a ditch, and we need to pray. Show me your faith, and I will show you my faithfulness. And he does, over and over and over. Some of you this morning, you're struggling with stuff. There's things you need to be healed of. Maybe just some stuff that really is something that you can do something about. And you're not doing anything. Maybe some of you are just struggling with certain addictions. Maybe, the, maybe you're just, oh man, if I could just quit smoking. Oh my gosh, if I could just, it's so addicting. If I could just do it, do something. Maybe God is calling you to do something. Maybe today you need to walk out of this place and throw your cigarettes in the trash can. And have a ridiculous kind of faith. Some of you maybe are having relationship problems. And your marriage is on the rocks. What are you doing about it? Are you getting counseling? Are you, do, is there for some forgiveness in your heart that's still lingering that you need to take care of? God can send the water, but sometimes we got to dig a ditch. Sometimes he's calling us to a faith that works. Maybe some of you are like, man, if I just was in a better financial situation, I just need some more money, God. I'm in trouble. And you're not tithing. You're not giving. And God's like, I've given you my promise. Show me your faith, and I will show you my faithfulness. Show me your faith, and I'll show you my faithfulness. We have a piece of land right behind me, 38 acres, and it's full of, of, of corn right now. And uh, we're not going to put a sign on that land. That's not the plan. We're going to put a building on that land. We also are not interested in going in the corn harvesting business as well. We don't want to do that. You know what we want to do? Soul harvesting business. That's what we want to do. We want to see people and more and more come to know Jesus. Change lives. Change souls. Are you with me this morning on that? Are you with me? Well, guess what? We're going to have to do something about that. 
God's like, I will send the rain, but you're going to have to dig some ditches. You're going to have to show me a faith that works. And as we go into this next season of our church, God is going to be calling all of us to do something. He's going to be calling us to a ridiculous kind of faith. Let me ask you this morning, are you ready for that? Are you ready? Are you ready to do what we need to do? Are you ready to show your faith so God can show his faithfulness and bring the harvest? Only God can send the water, but sometimes he wants you to dig a ditch. The second principle is this. Real faith, real faith believes big, but is willing to start small. Real faith is willing to believe big, but it's, it's, it, or real faith believes big, but is willing to start small. Sometimes I think we as Christians don't believe big enough. We don't believe big enough. We don't recognize how big and mighty our God is because our God is big and mighty. He can do more than we can think or imagine. Ephesians 3, uh, chapter, or chapter 3, verse 20 says, He is big. And we need to believe that kind of big God this morning. But as we believe big, we need to be willing to start small, to take some small steps. That's faith. So if we go back to our story, we think about their situation um, in the ninth century, how do you dig a ditch in the ninth century? I mean, okay, God's like, hey, I want you to dig some ditches. Do they get on the horn and rent a backhoe to come in? No, guess what? They got to do it small steps, right? One shovel load at a time. Real faith believes big, but is willing to start small, small steps. Zechariah verse four or chapter four verse ten says this: Do not despise these small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. Sometimes you have to start small. You have to be faithful in the small things to see a big difference. In, in January, we did a series called "Small Things, Big Difference," and I know a lot of you participated in that. You had that had that word that is going to just change your life because it's going to lead to those small steps that that's going to. Re- really change your life and make a big difference. Uh, there was a lady in our, our church who was so kind to let me share her story this morning. Uh, she grew up with uh, weight issues and food issues, and it just, it just rocked her world to the point that last year, May 1st, 2014, she, she looked to God and said, guess what? I'm going to be willing to change my life and make some small steps so I can see some big differences in my life. So May 1st, she commits this. May 1st of this year, 2015, she loses 75 pounds. 75 pounds. Can we give her a hand? Yeah, absolutely. Amazing story. Thank you, Karen, for letting me share this. And I didn't tell Karen's here, but I, I didn't tell you I was going to use this picture that I found on Facebook. But she, in the 80s, she had a favorite band named Winger, Winger I believe. And she... She can, she can now put that shirt on. That was for 24 years later. So give her a hand. That's awesome. It takes those small steps. You think about Orchard Church. <laughs> Just look around. We are growing by leaps and bounds. God is doing amazing stuff here. On pace for having probably, we'll probably have 1,500 people today. We'll probably have 15, which means we'll probably have more than I even thought uh, coming this fall. Amazing stuff. Going on at Orchard Church, we're building a building, 1,250 seat auditorium in this building that's going to be right behind us, and the harvest will keep coming in. God's doing amazing stuff here at Orchard Church. We asked you a few weeks ago to pray for us as we're looking to hire a church, our next church planter, because we want to be a church that has the vision of multiplying disciple-making churches. Guess what? We hired that person this week. This week, and they're going to be coming on our staff. Exciting. Exciting stuff. Big stuff happening. Orchard Church is a God-sized ministry. That's what it is, okay? It's huge, but guess what? It didn't start that way. It didn't. You know, where, you know how it started? It started with a family named the Damrons who moved to Denver with a vision from God to plant Orchard Church. And you know what? There wasn't 1,500 people in a church building waiting on them to vote them in as their next pastor. It was them. <laughs> and they started, I got a picture of, one, I think, one of their first meetings. If we'll put that on the screen. Uh, there it is, in their apartment. Eight to nine people. It starts with small steps, everybody. We need to believe big 
and have that kind of faith, but we've got to be willing to start small. And then they move into Prairie View High School a few years later. 40 to 50 people at this point, and they're coming to this place. If you guys just look around, they come into this place, and they're like, how are we going to fill this place up? How are we going to do this? And now here we are 10 years later going, how are we going to fit everybody in this place? We got like a year left. What are we going to do? We got to have the kind of faith that believes big, but is willing to start small. I remember uh, when I surrendered to the call of worship leading, I remember God gave me a specific vision. And I remember that vision and that clarity was that I was going to be leading hundreds of people in corporate worship. I just remember that. And that's always been very clear to me. But it didn't start that way. <laughs> it didn't start that way. It started small. In a, in a youth group or in a Bible study and leading people in passionate worship. And then I go to my first church in Taylorville, Illinois, which is a town of 11,000 people. I called it Mayberry. And we had, a, we had a small church. And we went from there to Florida, another small church. And we saw things grow. And then he brings me to Denver, Colorado. And here we are. You know, leading worship for a thousand plus adults every single Sunday. We gotta believe big. We gotta believe big, but we gotta be willing to start small. I think one of the problems that gets in our way as a society, and I think this is big, especially if you're a boss in here, is this word entitlement. Entitlement. I think what happens is we get, as a society and a culture, we've come to this place like, I want it all, and help me finish it, and I want it now. <laughs> We want it all, we want it now. We, we believe big, but we're not willing to start small. And a faith that works is a faith that's willing to start small and believe big. Jesus was very clear about this in Matthew 25, verse 21. He said, you've been faithful in handling the what? The small amount. So now I will give you many more responsibilities. Real faith believes big, but it's willing to start small. Only God can send the water, but sometimes he wants you to dig a ditch. We've got to remember that that real faith starts with small steps. If you want to run that marathon, you've got to conquer that first mile. Maybe some of us want to read the Bible. Man, we just want to read the whole Bible, and a lot of people have tried that and failed. And they're just, but we, we, will, we believe big. We're going to read the whole Bible. Well, you're not going to read it in a day. It's going to take small steps. It's going to take getting on you version, getting a small plan, and just being faithful every day and showing your faith so God can show his faithfulness. A couple weeks ago, I hiked my first 14er. I think that makes me a Coloradian or something like that. <clears throat> yeah, it was, it was horrible. It was, it was horrible. <laughs> Maybe my first and last. But I did it. I conquered it. And you stand on top of that mountain. And it took one step at a time. I didn't leap from the bottom. It's small steps. We believe big. We believe we're going to climb that mountain. But we've got to be willing to make those small steps in life. And what you do is you say, God, I believe you can. I will do what I can, but you're going to do what I can't. I believe you can. And then you just start where you are. You start where you are, you make those small steps. God loves when we're involved in his miracles. God loves for us to show our faith. He loves to see our faith because faith, we got to remember, faith without works, that faith that's not active, that shows no actions, that, that faith is dead. And it is impossible to please God without faith. So let's go back to our story as we close out today. We think about these three kings. They're thirsty, dying. They go to God and go to Elisha and say, what are we going to do? God says, dig some ditches. Start small, and I'll show you my faithfulness. And God shows his faithfulness here in verse 20 to round off this story. Verse 20 says this. Now it happened in the morning when the grain offering was offered that suddenly water came by way of Edom. And help me out, church, the land was filled with water. Okay, I'm going to give you another chance on that. And the land was filled with water. Only God can send the water. But sometimes he's going to ask us to dig a ditch. Some of you have a very significant need in your life. You've, see, you've been looking at it, this whole message. It's been in front of you. It's been glaring at you. And you're like, if only, if only, if only. But let's not forget that your greatest need becomes a blessing 
when it drives you to depend on God. Only God can send the water, but sometimes he asks us to dig a ditch. Real faith believes big, but is willing to start small church. Orchard Church, let's pray. Let's pray to be a church with ridiculous faith. Ridiculous faith. Hey, listen, it started that way in an apartment with a few people. May we as people continue that kind of ridiculous faith as a church moving forward. And everybody said, Amen. because we're going to believe God is big enough. We're going to believe the big things. We're going to be willing to start small. We're going to believe in God that he's going to send the water even before we see a cloud in the sky because God is big enough. Will you bow your heads with me this morning? Maybe you're here this morning and uh, as, I, as I was speaking and as you heard the scripture and the story and the, the application, there was something very glaring in front of you that you're dealing with. A need, an if only, something that's lacking in your life. And you're like, man, if only I had this. And you have this great big need, but you haven't done anything. You haven't shown God your faith. So that he can show you his faithfulness. And you're like, this message was for me today, for this particular week. I needed to hear this. I need prayer this week. If that's you, will you just lift your hand and say, yep, that's me, Gary. I need prayer in this. Hands all over the place. Hands all over the place. I'm going to include myself in that. Let me pray for us all today. Lord, we thank you for, for your word and your promise. And the power of your word this morning, morning, Lord, may we not only be hearers of it, but may we be doers of it. God, may we have so much faith in you that we can't help but act. And Lord, we, we come to you as people with our hands open saying, we need help. We need you. Give us the faith, Lord. Give us the faith, not only individually as people, but as a church. Lord, you know each and every story in this place. You know each and every need, God, and I pray for all of us, Lord, that we will show our faith to you so you can show your faithfulness to us. With heads still bowed and eyes still closed, you may be here this morning and yeah, you definitely have needs. You definitely, definitely have if onlys, but you've never actually experienced faith at all. You've never really surrendered and put your faith in God. And you've been running from that. And that's been a hole in your life and you just haven't surrendered yet. Well, if that's you this morning, I want, I want to encourage you. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 says it's by grace that you are saved through faith. The Lord is true, and his promises are true, and he says that if we submit to him, he will be our Lord, he will be our Savior, he will be our healer and our provider. So this morning, if that's you and you haven't put your faith in Jesus, you haven't, haven't surrendered to him, I want to plead with you to do that today. So I'm going to say this prayer. What you need to do is just say this prayer from your heart to God's heart to finally surrender to him. It's not the prayer that's going to save you. It's that faith in him to finally surrender to him. So if that's you, just, just say this prayer after me from your heart to God's heart. Dear Jesus, I believe in you. I finally surrender to you. I believe that you died for me, that you rose from the grave, and that you reign in eternity as king. Jesus, be the king of my life. Be the king of my heart and be the Lord of my life. Forgive me of my sins and save me. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. With every head bowed and eyes, eyes closed, if that's you this morning, you said, I finally put my faith in Jesus, I've been running for it. I finally put my faith in, in Jesus this morning. I, I trusted in him. I gave him my heart, finally. I want, we want to pray for you as a church with no one looking around. If that's you this morning, say, I finally put my faith in Jesus. Just raise your hand. We just want to, we want to pray for you this morning. If that's you, thank you, sir. If that's you, just keep your hands up. Amen. Thank you. Let me, let me pray for us. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your word and your promise. Lord, me, thank you for your faithfulness, God. May we show our faith and may we do something out of a heart of faith. Thank you, uh, Lord, that your, your promise is faithful and true, God. And, and Lord, we know you're going to be with us as we enter this week. 
We have things to do, ditches to dig, Lord. And may we show our faith to you and all God's people said. Amen. Let's thank the Lord for what he's done this morning. Amen. If you gave your heart to Jesus this morning, you finally surrendered to him, if you will help us out, just check that on your connection card and let us know. We want to follow up with you and help you on that journey. And if this is your first time with us, again, thank you for worshiping with us. If you'll fill out that connection card, put it in the offering bucket as it goes by. We want to just follow up with you, send you a free gift in the mail. Well, let's all stand together this morning. We're going to worship with our gifts with a song.